Thank you for reading God's Word and uh, for leading us in worship. We're going to do some theology this morning. don't know what theology stirs up in your minds. Normally it's big books and dusty tomes and think, oh, this is going to be terribly academic. Well, it isn't. We're going to do some real theology this morning. And theology is just talking about God, thinking about God, working out what God has shown us about himself so that we get into God and think his thoughts after him. That's theology. And the letter that we are reading from, 1 John, gives us some of the simplest, purest, most profound theology in the Bible. Are you ready for it? I'm going to start with 1 John chapter 1, just to get us into this, because this is, this is the big stuff. This is the important stuff. This is, this is the really deep stuff. Ready for this? 1 John chapter 1, God is light. Now that's theology. You think about that for a little while, and you are starting to get an idea of who God is. Because this is not just theology, this is applied theology that changes our lives. Let me read to you, just so you get the flavor, uh, 1 John 1 from verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him, that's from Jesus, and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Chapter 2, verse 9. Those who claim to be in the light, but hate a fellow believer, are still in the darkness. Those who love their fellow believers live in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But those who hate a fellow believer, are in the darkness and and walk around in the darkness. They don't know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. You see, this is very black and white, isn't it? It's crystal clear. This is getting us into God who is holy. Completely different from all that's around and is dark and murky. He is pure light. And if we claim to be those who are in the light, we need to walk in the light. Which means it's going to change the way we relate to other people. There's no way that you can say, you know God and hate your brothers and sisters because that's such an obvious lie, because that is, you know, hate like that is just so obvious. Darkness, it stands out as just not fitting with the light. God is light. You ready for lesson two from 1 John? This is, this is even more profound, if it could be more profound. God is love. That's 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. And it's applied theology. Listen to this, 1 John chapter 4, from verse 16. We've heard it read, in the middle of the verse. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. That's what we're thinking about this morning. Start of our passage. Dear friends, or or quite literally, beloved. It's the agapetoi. Loved ones. That's who we are, by the way, because God is love. And if we'd come to know him, that's our identity. We're God's loved ones. Beloved, let us Love one another, 
For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love doesn't know God because God is love. So how do we get into this profoundly simple? Because, you know, dear me, we can all, we, we've got it, haven't we? You, you have got, you know, more important than all of the fine print in the big book is that if you've got hold of God is light and God is love, you can probably spell out the rest of the book from it. And we can all remember it, can't we? We've got the message. God is light, God is love, but how do we get into it so that it actually changes our lives and our relationships as the people of God? Well, here it is. Here's our text for today. It's verse 19, and this might be just as difficult to remember as the main theology. Here it is. Here's the applied theology. We love because he first loved us. That's it. We just need to think about what that means for a few minutes. He first loved us. Let's start at the very beginning. A very good place to start. You know, we don't start with our love. He first loved us. That's where we start. Verse 10. This is love. Not that we loved God but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. We didn't start off loving God, but when we were still his enemies, he loved us. God is love. And he loved us not because we're lovely, not because we're lovable, but because he is love. It's what he does. It's who he is. God is love. And before we even thought of loving him, he loved us. Love is not principally something we feel or even just something we do. Love is something that we appreciate. To be loved is just so good, isn't it? To know that you're loved by anybody, dear me, that's a good news thing. But to know that you're loved by God, well, doesn't that change the way we think of ourselves and everyone else? And God's love is not some sort of fluffy, woolly, mushy, emotional sort of love. He sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. The, the old word was a propitiation, you know, a sacrifice that satisfies God's righteous judgment for all the bad things that we have done so that we're put in a good relationship with God again. This is the sort of love that God has for us. Let's uh, Nine, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. His death was for our life. This was God's self-giving love. God's son-giving love. You know, I brought another book with me. You won't be able to read the print on this one, but this this is called The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God. Now this, this is deceptively easy looking, but it isn't. Uh, this is well worth reading. And that's what we're thinking about, the difficult doctrine of the love of God. You think, oh, Jesus' love is very wonderful. We can sing it to the children. And great, but Jesus' love is very wonderful. You know, you've got to wonder at this sort of love that is so self-giving. Dear me, when you think about it, so son-giving. What parent would give his child, even for us lot, 
You know, we're not worth it, are we? We, we read stories of, of Abram and Isaac and, and we think, how could God ask a father to sacrifice his son? And we're just so relieved when God says, stop! And he doesn't have to do it. But God didn't stop when it came to his son. He sent his son to be a sacrifice to deal with his right judgment for sin so that we could live. I can well understand why a few years ago there was a furore when people were talking about this as, as cosmic child abuse. You've got to face it that that's what it looks like. But then you've got to see what is really going on here. Because this is an expression of God is light. In him there is no darkness at all, which means as he looks on the world with all that's wrong with it, he's got to do something about that. He's got to judge it. He can't have that in his presence for eternity, can he? He's got to do something about it. And yet, this great God who is pure light and must have everything so right is filled with compassion and his heart is breaking for people because this God who is light is also love. And in his heart he's feeling for all of these pitiful people like you and me and caring for them because he's made us in his image and we've messed it up. And he, he knows he must judge and he knows that he loves. And his son who has been the object of the Father's love for all eternity and who has loved the Father from all eternity, responds in his heart of love to the Father's heart. And words like these are given as an expression. We read it in, in Hebrews uh, chapter 10. When Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you didn't desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you weren't pleased. Then I said, here I am. It's written about me in the scroll. I've come to do your will, my God. And the Son, out of love for the Father, and the Father, out of love for the Son, is basically saying, this is what we said all along that we would do. We put it there, and we gave all these pictures of the sacrifices and the offerings. But now let's do it. You prepared a body. For me, And he, with all the pain of a father giving of his son, with all of the bravery of a son who loves his father and who wants to ensure that God's light remains pure light and God's love is demonstrated, he comes and takes our place and dies our death so that we might live. This is pure, profound theology, which is offensive until we see how glorious it actually is. This is the gospel of our glorious God. What does our text say then? We love... Because he first loved us. And notice who it is that we love. Verse 20. If we say we love God and hate a brother or sister, we're liars. For we do not, if we do not love a fellow believer whom we have seen, we can't love God whom we've not seen. And he has given us this command. Those who love God must also love one Another. It's very easy to think, isn't it? God has loved us so much, we should love him back. And of course we do. His love evokes that sort of love. That's our worship, isn't it? He's loved us and we want to say thank you and we love him because he is actually lovely. <laughs> Pure love. And we love him. But what God wants is not just that we should love him. But in loving him, we should reflect him and love the unlovely like he has loved. Which is why he puts us in church, so that we can practice this. 
You know, we, we all think you know, church should be all sweetness and light and everything's okay. No, church is where we rub off the rough edges from one another and we say, oh dear, if only people were nice and easy to live with, like me. Now, if, if my wife was here, she'd tell you that <laughs> I find it easy to live with me. Yeah? But I need to learn to live with you, who are different from me, and to grow to become like God, who is love, who loves these awkward people. And if we practice in here, we'll do it out there, won't we? Yeah? That's what church is. This is where we work out our theology in practice. And we're still a long way from perfect, aren't we? But that's where we're going. We love him. The challenge is not to love God back. It's to love one another. The message of the cross gives you it all. There's profound theology. God loves us. I got told off in one church where I was pastor because I was doing the sign of the cross too much. They thought I was going Catholic. <laughs> but God loves us, yeah? And so we love one another. Yeah, that's it. We work it out in practice. It's not just a matter of having it there. It's what we live. We live this message of the cross. Jesus said with great clarity, if you love me, keep my commands. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. He does this in the context of when he's just washed the disciples' feet. I was with the church yesterday and... Uh, they were talking about the, the humility and the grace that's in that church. And it's partly due to the, the founding elder, who's a, who's a the local GP, a justice of the peace. He was in the General Medical Council, all that sort of thing. But when visitors came to his house, and I've heard this from many people, they would say, just put your shoes outside the door when you go to bed, and I'll clean them for you, and they'll be there in the morning. It's a working out. This is This is true discipleship. This is what... Love is like for one another. You see, love is not something that we feel simply or that we do. It's something we appreciate. It starts with God. It impacts on us and it enables us to love. So, verse 7, love comes from God. That's where we start. We are beloved, agape toy, dear friends, loved ones, so let's love one another. It goes on. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And the very idea is that the, the spirit of God, God comes and takes up residence in us and we remain in him and he loves in us so that we are caught up in the loving action of God. God's love is made complete in us. You see, it's like father, like son, and like sons and daughters. It's not just something we do, it's something we appreciate. And as we appreciate it more and more, his love for us responds not just in love for him, but overflows in love. For one another. This is profoundly simple, deceptively simple, profoundly simple, pure, applied theology. God is light, and He can see all through all of the pretense. God is light. And if we say we're walking in the light, we've got to live this way. Otherwise, it's a plain and obvious lie. God is light. God is loved. So beloved, loved ones, let us love one another. For love is from God. We love 
because he first loved us. Heavenly Father, we've got the message. You couldn't be clearer. We want it to be true and to be seen so that people looking in here at us will know that we're following Jesus, not because we get it right all the time, but we know what to do when things are wrong. We love bearing the pain to reach out to others with the love of God in Christ. Amen.